expertise also. Our Norwegian uh, Institute of Public Health colleague, uh, Ernst Christian uh, Rudley, who was not here today. So to you, Max. Hey, thanks, Rebecca. <laughs> Uh, so as Rebecca alluded to, um, I am neither an expert in climate nor in health, uh, but I have been talking to a number of people who are experts in both. And I'm trying to try to summarize what I've learned from them or what I've learned from reading a bit about the topic as I've worked on it in the past year or so. Uh, so this is just a quick introduction uh, as we get started today. Um, so first off, just a question. We're mostly here working on health programs. So why should we be concerned with climate change in a health context? Uh, this is a quote that I took from the WHO website, uh, which is pretty long. You can you can read it uh, when you look at the slides of the video. The key point here is that uh, climate change affects everyone. It affects the health of everyone, but it particularly affects people in low resource countries for a number of reasons that are both related to the, the climate in those countries, but also the resources, infrastructure, and other issues that are also present. Um, so, as the WHO points out, uh, climate change can set back the entire development agenda for 50 years uh, and really cause a lot of uh, harm and negative progress in the kinds of programs that we've been working on and the DHS2 community has been working on for public health. So just that fact alone means there's something to be concerned about because it's going to affect all the progress that's been made in uh, all, any number of disease programs. So um, I did take a slide from my colleague, uh, or, Ernst Christian Rodland from the Norwegian Institute of Public Health that tries to diagram a bit of how climate change and biodiversity loss uh, have effects on health and how it lead to certain health threats. So here you can see a sort of diagram that shows uh, exposure pathways leading to existing fun vulnerabilities or how they relate to existing vulnerabilities, including a number of health system capacity and capability issues and the potential outcomes from those. So you can see that they range from very acute uh, risks like physical injury, which you can imagine coming from things like a flood event or an extreme heat wave or extreme wind, all of which can be caused by uh, climate change or variation and down through more longer term or second degree uh, sort of effects such as influence in vector borne diseases, influence in malnutrition, influence in mental health. Um, so a number of ways in which climate change is interacting to uh, with human health to cause a variety of health, health outcomes that also are either immediate or long-term or both. And you also see there's a number of physical impacts here on in infrastructure, impacts on the health system itself, uh, such as the ability to deliver health care. For example, in a flood situation, it might be harder to carry out routine services. Um, so this is a, a giant uh, interconnected web which he also, this is another slide from uh, Ernst Christian. You can see here a few different kinds of climatic or environmental events and a few outcomes. And the reality is that these are not sort of one-to-one -one relationships. A lot of these do interact with each other in fairly complex ways. So you might have an issue with a flood that leads to both uh, food and water security. The stress from that can also contribute to mental health. It can also contribute to migration, which migration can also contribute to things like the spread of diseases. Um, so a lot of this is kind of interconnected, which makes it a very complex problem to deal with. And I think nobody has ever said that climate change is a simple problem to deal with. Uh, and so here in the DHS2 context, what we're primarily talking about is the health part of climate health, not how do we fix climate change, but how do we deal with the impacts of climate change on health? And to do so, we have to kind of quantify it a little bit and have to quantize it a little bit because given the network effects, uh, that exist and how complex they are. I think what we're looking at in this presentation is how do we isolate some that we can actually work on productively in the shorter term as a starting point. Uh, I think that's where we're at right now with the DHS2 ecosystem is just starting to move in this direction of given that climate change is a pressing problem, uh, what concretely can we do in the short term to start addressing it and addressing the effects that it has on, on human health. Um, so that's why we're starting here with health. Um, so I put this as the good news, um, which I put that there because really when we're talking about climate change and health, we're not really envisioning new health risks per se. What we're seeing is an intensification of existing health risks or potentially existing health risks that are now present in areas where they weren't present before due to things like increasing heat or, increase, or changing weather patterns that might lead to vector-borne diseases being present in areas where they haven't been previously, such as highland areas of Africa, which may now be more um, exposed to mosquito-borne illnesses than they previously were. 
So having sort of an idea of how we can quantify those changes and then use that information to proactively respond to them or to predict them. Uh, and so as I put here, the other part of that good news is that a lot of countries already have DHS2 systems in place that are collecting health data on these health risks. And here, these icons are taken from our, our website and they sort of represent um, metadata toolkits or health toolkits, which uh, exist, which a lot of countries have used to strengthen these health programs through digitization. Uh, this is kind of a different diagram that approaches the material from a few slides ago in a slightly different way. Uh, I like this one, which is taken from a WHO website, because it really clearly shows the health outcomes in a sort of context that we're used to dealing with it in, which is this kind of health program context. Um, and so as I put here, uh, a lot of these health outcomes are actually health programs that DHS2 is used for to collect data to manage health programs, to make decisions about uh, prioritization, about resource allocation. Uh, and then on the more general uh, side, health systems and facility outcomes, this is the kind of service data and the kind of health system operational data that's also collected in a lot of HMIS systems. So we already have a fairly good uh, data foundation to use to construct climate and health systems because DHS2 is already being used in so many countries to work on these health areas, which we see as potential health risks related to climate change. Um, in thinking through this with the eye towards making a concrete project, uh, we have started to further group it into what we see as some uh, potential areas of DHS2 use case development. Uh, this is not intended to limit the use of DHS2 in this area. It's really just a starting point that we see as being a high potential based on the existence of current DHS2 systems. So here we're talking about a three different broad categories, uh, infectious diseases, nutrition and food security, and um, hydrometeorological events. Uh, this is taken from a book that I recommend you read if you're interested in the topic, which is uh, Climate Information for Public Health Action. Um, and the first two columns here, uh, I think, are ones that we're going to hear about later today in this presentation. Uh, we have a couple of systems that have been uh, piloted at various stages that deal with climate-sensitive infectious diseases. Uh, the Mozambique team will be here today presenting about one of those and their work on it so far. Uh, there's another example from uh, Laos that has been developed uh, and is in the sort of proof of concept stage. Uh, and here you can see that we can use, in this, in this context, uh, climate data to try to predict uh, outbreaks in a different time scales. And also to, as I said before, to monitor the spread of diseases into different areas where it hasn't been present before. Uh, for nutrition and food security, these are a little bit different topics, but they're linked obviously by food. Um, and the Malawi team will present today on an agriculture management system that uses climate data to try to proactively help farmers to react to uh, changing climate and extreme weather events. Uh, the last column here, this is, I think, more exploratory for us because we don't typically have a lot of health systems using DHS2 to monitor um, the kinds of health outcomes that are related to extreme heat. Um, however, some of those outcomes relate to things like NCDs, if it's hypertension, for example, or mental health. Um, and there are some few countries that have started exploring those use cases for DHS2, and that could be potentially linked to a monitoring system here. But also the use of DHS2 as a surveillance platform, I think also provides a foundation for constructive work in this area. If you know an extreme heat event is coming and you know you have a vulnerable population in the area where it's uh, expected to occur, you can do things like proactively send messages to health providers or even to the vulnerable populations if you're using a tracker system that could alert them and could help them to take adaptive action uh, in advance of that event. So these are the kinds of things we're thinking of in the heat uh, context. And then flooding, uh, we have seen DHS2 used to assist a flood response in Pakistan uh, last year. Um, and flood response isn't just the immediate physical damage from the flood, but also affects things like service delivery of health uh, care. It also affects the spread of infectious diseases, uh, such as waterborne diseases. And so here's a lot of linkages between that kind of event and health that we could potentially explore with the DHS2 system. Uh, now we need to get to the hard part, which is climate. Uh, this is an area where I think the DHS2 community does not have a lot of expertise, and it's also an area which is incredibly complicated. So I don't want to under estimate how difficult it will be to build uh, climate-informed DHS2 systems. Uh, the good news is we've been talking to people who are experts in this field, and I think they're interested in working with uh, the HISP community, with the DHS2 community on systems like this. Um, and there are a number of ways to approach the challenges I've listed here. 
Um, but these are challenges we have to really take seriously when we start thinking about designing these systems. Uh, the data needs to match, needs to be the same geographical scale, the same temporal scale, uh, in order to make it be useful for analysis. Uh, there are severe challenges in a lot of uh, low and middle income countries with actually getting uh, granular climate data. And so part of this project that we hope to embark on might be liaising with uh, meteorological uh, agencies in different countries to look for ways to assist in digitization of climate data, especially through our partners who work in the climate uh, climate demand. Uh, we also have challenges of how to actually link DHS2 as a platform with climate data, given the sort of the potential for sort of immensely large volume of data for climate analysis and the sort of complex and advanced statistical analysis you have to do to make these sort of uh, uh, um, projections on um, predicted events. So these are all technical challenges that will have to be looked into and resolved in order to uh, resolve uh, that part. And I think some of the projects we'll hear about today have already taken some approaches to incorporating this climate data. So we're hopefully to learn from them as we look forward to trying to make more generic approaches or share uh, generic approaches that other countries can take advantage of. And finally, the organizational challenges. This is something we especially heard very clearly from our conversations with WHO. Um, looking into systems that use climate data to create predictive um, indicators also requires a sort of organizational change. It requires a, a mindset change and requires a buy-in and trust in the data that's coming out of that system. Uh, otherwise, you're asking people to contribute a lot of resources potentially uh, to something that they think will be a, a, a risk or they think will be a problem, but hasn't actually happened yet. And so having that kind of um, health system that reacts proactively to a climate informed prediction is something that would require a certain level of institutional capacity building and funding and um, organizational change. So um, there's a bit of good news there, which is I think, especially due to the comment at the beginning about climate change affecting low and middle income countries very severely, despite those countries not being the primary drivers of climate change, there are a lot of potential funding sources out there for countries to uh, get climate adaptation assistance. So if countries are able to build systems that can use climate data to help population health, there are a number of funds that exist to uh, support countries in their climate change strategies and climate change and health strategies. Um, so here's some examples of the systems I mentioned. You can just see uh, some starting work on incorporating uh, climate, weather, rainfall data, um, trying to map it against health data to see what the useful patterns are for analysis. Uh, here's a screenshot from the Malawi ag agriculture system. So uh, we'll hear about a couple of these uh, today in more detail. Um, and I'd just like to close by saying that we are actually trying to take this on as a project and to learn from countries that are leading the way on climate and health and try to develop them into a generic approach and generic tools that can be shared and adopted in the open source model. Uh, so if anyone is working on a project like this or has expertise that would be relevant to us, we encourage you to get in touch and uh, we will be sharing information on our work as it continues. And uh, it's a very exciting opportunity, obviously a very big challenge. Um, we hope to work with you on it. Thank you. Thank you so much, Max. I think we're all really looking forward to uh, seeing where this work takes us. So it's a pleasure to introduce a pair of colleagues. So blessings in Tizemu Kamanga and Matthew Mavola uh, from the Ministry of Health Malawi and Public Health Institute Malawi, um, who are going to share about building a resilient One Health surveillance platform and responding to public health emergencies. And just a little teaser that following these colleagues, we have a representative from another ministry in, um, in Malawi, so we can start to see how these uh, cross cross sectoral data platforms are going to come together. So welcome.
Good afternoon, everyone. Yeah, I'm Blessings Kamanga from Malawi. I work for the uh, Ministry of Health. So together with uh, my colleague, uh, Matthew Mvula from Malawi as well, working with Luku International. Yeah. Thank you. We'll be presenting on uh, building resilient one health surveillance systems uh, to respond to public health emergencies, uh, as well as Thank you. Uh, as well as the, uh, responding to uh, uh, the pandemics that uh, might be there. So uh, through the presentation, I'll look at the uh, background of uh, EI data implementation in Malawi. Uh, we'll look at uh, how the one surveillance platform was uh, developed. And then we'll look at success stories, uh, challenges, and then we'll look at uh, uh, what we aim to, uh, to achieve in the long run. So the uh, adoption of uh, EI DSR in, uh, IDSR in Malawi uh, dates back to uh, 2002. And then from that time, uh, there have been several initiatives uh, just to ensure that uh, there is uh, some uh, streamlined processes uh, in IDSR. Uh, so for example, uh, in 2015, uh, there was uh, a project funded by uh, World Bank, uh, which was looking at uh, how uh, uh, IDSR uh, can be uh, digitalized. And then uh, later on in 2017, we also had another project funded by UNICEF, where we were looking at uh, uh, implementing uh, EIDSR with the use of uh, short uh, uh, message uh, service. And then, uh, considering uh, the relationship that is there uh, between the uh, uh, human beings as well as uh, the environment, uh, there was a need to take uh, a one health approach whereby we're looking at uh, several sectors coming together, uh, looking at uh, different ways uh, how uh, optimal health can be, uh, can be achieved. So uh, in 2019, that's when the uh, one health surveillance platform uh, was built on the DHS2 platform. And then, uh, during uh, COVID-19 pandemic, uh, that's now when uh, its usefulness uh, came to light. Uh, as uh, during that time, uh, there are several things that uh, uh, happened. So uh, for example, uh, we used the same uh, platform uh, to ensure that uh, we do the port of entry screening, uh, case-based surveillance, contact, contact tracing, uh, and then it also went further even to uh, involve uh, the education sector, where we're also looking at uh, COVID-19 surveillance uh, in schools. And then uh, when we started administering the vaccine, to the uh, COVID-19 vaccine to the population, uh, the OHSP platform uh, also uh, came in handy as all the uh, uh, people uh, who were vaccinated, all the details uh, were captured uh, on, the, uh, on the system. So uh, by and by, uh, things started changing uh, uh, due to the uh, emerging factors. So for example, we had the uh, several cyclones uh, hitting Malawi, uh, cyclone Gombe, cyclone Anna, and then recently uh, cyclone Flede. And then we also had uh, some outbreaks uh, like cholera. So we said, are we going to have uh, like uh, a system for each and every pandemic that comes? I said, no. Uh, let's look at what we have and then let's enhance uh, whatever we have to ensure that uh, it is resilient uh, to the point that uh, it should be able to uh, supply uh, the decision makers with the data that they need in order to uh, respond to uh, such uh, emergencies. So I'll call upon my colleague, uh, Matthew, uh, just to highlight on what sort of enhancements uh, did we make uh, to the OHSP to ensure that uh, it is uh, resilient. So. Um, uh, thank you so much, blessings. Uh, so uh, in the early days of uh, cholera, uh, the cholera cases before the siege were not that much. And the, in the southern region, that's the southern part of Malawi. That's where it started. And it started in the dry season. And we had few uh, cases. So it was easier. Uh, we uh, said, I mean, in uh, um, Sanje, they started reporting using OHSP. So, but during the uh, stage of the cases, it was overwhelming in terms of the workload. So they were not able to capture data using the OHSP. Instead, they started uh, 
using Excel, Microsoft Excel, and they were generating some uh, line lists from the districts and sending them. So the challenge is that uh, they kept on having uh, poor quality data. So the Colela um, incident management team uh, decided that we should uh, revamp reporting uh, uh, Colela cases through One Health Surveillance uh, Platform. So the main issues is that uh, it was too long for them to report. Uh, and uh, uh, during the uh, cholera uh, situation. So the solution was to uh, enhance it so that we can shorten the uh, data capturing process. Uh, this was based on the input that we got from FIM uh, uh, the uh, uh, specialist. So the team spent uh, three days to uh, fulfill the request. So that is confirmation of the requirements, the configuration communication as well as the development of the training materials and even conducting the uh, training of trainers. So this was done uh, during that period. So the results that we got is that uh, the DHS2 based one health surveillance platform has demonstrated a uh, high flexibility as well as resilience. That is, it's uh, aiding the Ministry of Health to improve reporting in terms of timeliness as well as uh, accuracy. And at the same time, we have also developed uh, dashboards within the DHS2 One Health Surveillance uh, Platform, uh, as well as uh, in Tableau, so that uh, various stakeholders can have access and make well-informed decisions. So the updated tracker has also been deployed uh, after conducting uh, hybrid training, both physical as well as virtually, and the various uh, surveillance uh, officers are using uh, across Malawi, you know the 29 uh, districts that we have in Malawi. And as we are talking, uh, they are even doing some bug data entry so that we can reduce the uh, workload that we have because we had a large volume of uh, data. So this is just an interface of one of the examples of the uh, uh, stage in uh, patient registration as well as in lab uh, results. So we have also faced some challenges in terms of the implementation uh, as well as long-term challenges. Uh, like for the implementation, the challenges in terms of connectivity in some areas, as well as lack of gadgets uh, when capturing data, as well as in adequate uh, training uh, plus supervision. And it, for the long-term one, uh, data security is also an issue. As we have already said, this is where we are keeping even individual level data, not just aggregate data. So we are looking in that as well so that we can enhance our data security, um, as well as the sustainability uh, in terms of financial uh, infrastructure, as well as human resource. So these are some of uh, the challenges that we have. And on the way forward, uh, we continue to uh, integrate the OHSP with other uh, health information systems uh, like the uh, HMIS, as well as the uh, development of other components within the OHSP. As we said, this is the uh, One Health Surveillance uh, System, but we have just uh, implemented the human component. So the other components like the animal, as well as the environment that we are looking forward to implement. Of course, discussions are still underway with uh, the animal as well as the uh, environment. Uh, so looking into uh, integrating, having climate data, as well as uh, the NAMIS uh, uh, system that we have. So we have to appreciate uh, these organi organizations that have helped us along the way, even for us to come here, the development and all other stages, like Luku International, UNICEF, uh, WHO, uh, GIZ and all these other organizations. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Blessings and Martin. Um, I particularly like that part about enhancing the case-based reporting by making it easier, making it feasible to do so. Um, that's not an easy thing to do. Our next presenter is uh, Jennifer Nicosi. From, she's an economist and also um, the, the system coordinator for the Integrated National Agricultural uh, Management Information System, 
And what I really liked about these two uh, presentations going side by side was that uh, from each of these sectors, it is a focus on integration of data and also um, resilience. So the floor is to you. Uh, thank you. I hope you can hear me. Am I audible? Ah, okay. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is uh, Jennifer Nkosi, as already uh, indicated by Rebecca, and I work from in the Ministry of Agriculture uh, in Malawi. So, and in the Ministry of Agriculture, uh, we have developed our own system uh, using the DHIS2 platform. And uh, we are calling it the National Agriculture Management Information System. And uh, this system, we are using it uh, for uh, different use. And one of it, it's uh, climate resilience and agriculture extension. So my presentation, I will focus on how we want uh, to use the system uh, to strengthen climate resilience and also enhance agriculture extension uh, to the farmers uh, that we work with uh, in Malawi. So my structure in terms of the interview, I uh, will focus on the NAMIS overview, what's the vision and the current status where we are, and also the climate smart drive, what we want to achieve uh, in terms of climate and also in terms of agriculture extension, uh, the challenges uh, that we are currently facing and uh, the way forward and uh, the next steps uh, that we want uh, to take uh, as the ministry. So the NAMIS uh, is a comprehensive integrated system uh, that we have developed uh, to collect, analyze, and disseminate uh, agricultural information from, uh, uh, from the point of our collection to the national level. Uh, the NAMIS system uh, was uh, developed with a view of enhancing uh, agriculture information in, in, the, in the ministry. And uh, the system was uh, developed based on the existing structures uh, that the ministry had. And uh, from that, we came up with 18 modules uh, that will be embedded in the NAMI system. And uh, the system, we started implementing it in uh, 2018. Uh, that was when we started uh, developing the conceptual framework, uh, the implementation plan, but the actual rolling out, we started uh, last year. And also in the system, we have also customized applications uh, that we have developed on top of the system uh, to facilitate uh, the data collection and uh, the reporting. So our point of uh, data collection for most data sets in the system, it's at the farmer level, the ones uh, we work with. And uh, the data from the NAMI system is being used uh, by different partners uh, that we work with. We have uh, uh, the Minister of Finance, the Minister of Trade. We also have development partners, uh, the SCSOs, that's the civil societies. They're able to get uh, information uh, that we generate uh, from the system. So what has been currently, what have we achieved? So out of the 18 modules uh, that we have uh, developed and customized in the system, we have managed to roll out uh, 12 modules. And one of the modules that is gaining momentum in the ministry, like uh, the donors are interested, is the farm organization uh, where we are uh, registering households uh, that we are working with uh, at household level. And also we have the lead farmer. Uh, we're also registering them in the system. And uh, this system we are being implementing in uh, 12 out of uh, 28 districts. Uh, this is where we had to source funds uh, from the project. Uh, they, are able, they have uh, supported us in, uh, uh, in implementing this system in 28 districts. So we have currently uh, trained almost 1,622 uh, extension workers uh, who are, are collecting uh, data on different modules. Uh, we have uh, the, the farm organization, uh, we have uh, the weather information that we are collecting, and um, the market prices is one of them, and also the food situation, where we are able to assess uh, the current uh, food status of the households. 
And from there, we are able to gen uh, generate uh, visualization and reports uh, that are being used uh, by our seniors uh, for informed decision making. So my focus on today's presentation is on two modules uh, that we have in the in the in that system. We have the maturity uh, module and also the farmer organization. So on the maturity module, we are focusing on the rainfall data because this is what uh, we have been doing in the past ten or more years, uh, collecting uh, rainfall data by the uh, extension workers. And also here, we also want to enhance agash extension, whereby we are registering uh, the lead farmers that we work with as a module of uh, disseminating extension uh, messages. Uh, in our ministry, we have a challenge there, whereby we have high vacancy rates in terms of the number of extension workers. So we use uh, lead farmers who are volunteers within the community that they are trained on different technologies and uh, we use uh, we work with them to disseminate uh, a cash extension messages and technologies uh, to the farmers so on climate change uh, malawi has already also indicated by the uh, previous presenter from minister of health uh, we have been hit uh, by uh, series of cyclones for two or three consecutive years uh, the recent one was the uh, Freddy, Cyclone Freddy, uh, which had a huge impact, uh, uh, devastating impact on the farmers in terms of their livelihood, uh, uh, including um, agriculture aspect and nutrition. So for our, for our system, we are looking at how can we strengthen uh, these farmers uh, in climate resilience and also linking uh, the climate data that we have with the extension uh, delivery uh, system. So for the system, we are looking at uh, having advisory services uh, based on uh, our climate uh, focus. That's our drive. Uh, that will also guide in terms of uh, crop selection and planning for the farmers. And also if the farmers should be able to access uh, financial and uh, insurance services. At the end of the day, we want uh, to build uh, the resilience of the farmers uh, against uh, climate change. And our vision uh, for the system is that we need to have a better weather data. Uh, currently, we are just collecting uh, rainfall data, but we would want that we also collect other parameters of weather data, including temperature and uh, humidity, so that we can have a comprehensive uh, information uh, that we can analyze and generate extension services uh, and send it to uh, uh, the farmers. Uh, planning guidance based on data and time uh, based on the data that uh, we want uh, to be generating the system that also we had started already where we want the farmers uh, to be able to come up with best farm practices uh, that they can use to mitigate against uh, the effects of uh, climate change uh, disaster planning and management that's at national level even at community level and also we want uh, to be able to have a combined analytics uh, in terms of combining how climate and weather is affecting our crop production, animal production, and nutrition. I think we also had some uh, when, where we have we are we are working with the Ministry of Health on one health system. So we want um, the system to be as comprehensive as possible. So what are the tools uh, that we are working uh, and that we have done? Uh, in the system. So currently we have uh, 379 weather stations uh, that have been configured uh, as the part of the reporting hierarchy. So these weather stations, they are stationed at community level and uh, these are manned and managed by the extension workers. And once they collect that information, they're able to send it into the system. And also this information also is used by the department of meteorological services. They also uh, gather some of uh, the information uh, that uh, we have, uh, that we collect uh, uh, at the community level uh, to do with our rainfall. And as I said, it's a community level reporting. So it's uh, on the rainfall data. In terms of uh, our efforts uh, through extension services, uh, in the system, we have registered uh, 6,603 lead farmers and 85 farm field schools. 
uh, that have been registered in the system. So these are the modules that we models uh, that we use in dissemination of Akasha technologies and uh, messages. So we want that once we generate uh, this uh, uh, climate data, the climate information and products in the system, we are able to send uh, uh, this information to the lead farmers and the farmer field schools uh, that we have registered uh, in the system and they disseminate uh, the extension messages based on uh, the products uh, that have been produced uh, in the system. So we are also able to monitor and map the interventions that are being implemented by these lead farmers and the farmer food schools. So this is just a snapshot of the visualizations, uh, some of the uh, data uh, that we have uh, started collecting. Uh, that was in, we have started last year as I indicated, we started last year in 2022. And uh, this is, has been the progress in terms of the reed farmer registration in 12 uh, districts. So what are other efforts uh, that other projects and partners uh, are implementing outside uh, the NAMI system? And also we are looking at the efforts of having collaborating with them so we can have more of like an integrated uh, system. Uh, we are not able to duplicate, duplicate efforts. So we have the Shire Valley Transform Transformation Project. Uh, they are generating uh, their partnership with the Department of Meteorological Services. Uh, where they get the climate information uh, products, uh, weather forecasts, and from there they're able to generate a great extension messages and uh, they are uh, sent to the uh, farmers that they are working with under the project. And also we have um, the Department of MET uh, themselves, uh, they do produce uh, weekly weather forecasts. Uh, and do share with uh, partners and also Minister of Agriculture is uh, one of them. And also we have a project called Participatory Integrated Climate Services for Agriculture. So this one, it's being managed by the Department of Extension within the ministry uh, together with other partners. So they are implementing uh, this the same approach whereby they do uh, get uh, weather forecasts uh, from the Department of uh, Climate Change. And from there, they, are, they generate extension messages, uh, guiding them on what the farmer should do uh, based on the, uh, the weather information that has been generated uh, by the uh, department. So what has been the challenges? Uh, we limited availability of data beyond uh, rainfall. As I indicated earlier, we're just concentrating on the temperature uh, we are concentrating on the rainfall, but we are, we, we are not collecting uh, the temperature and uh, humidity uh, uh, data. And that's our focus. We want to develop more tools uh, to collect other parameters of uh, rainfall, uh, of uh, weather information. Uh, insufficient instrumentation uh, for collecting uh, weather data. So you find that most of uh, the weather stations that we have at community level, they only have a linkage, but they don't have other uh, weather uh, data collection instruments. Uh, challenges in uh, importation of historical data. Uh, so that has been a challenge, not only uh, to do with weather, but also other modules. Uh, since we have started migrating from uh, paper-based to electronic, uh, so some of the information, uh, the historical information that we have, some of them are personalized, others um, in paper form, others they are missing. So it has been a challenge to gather all that historical data and import it into the system. And also the other challenge is limited capacity uh, development for the staff. Uh, we are dealing with um, extension workers that have different capacity uh, in IT skills. So that has been a challenge as well uh, for us, uh, but um, we are trying as much as possible, uh, building them their capacity on how they can uh, use uh, the dynamic system and uh, yeah, utilize it. Then we have uh, technological infrastructure limitations. Uh, we're having a challenge of uh, gadgets, uh, non-functional gadgets. That has also been one of um, a main challenge uh, that has been drawing us back in terms of data collection in the system. Uh, 
and also limited financial resources for implementation and uh, maintenance. Uh, currently, we are only receiving support from one project, and that project uh, we're calling ASWAP SP2 is being implemented only in 12 districts. So the data that we are collecting right now, we are focusing on the 12 districts, but our vision is that um, the information that we are collecting under the system uh, should cover countrywide. So that's uh, one of the challenges uh, that we have. So what are the current efforts and uh, directions uh, that we want to take as the ministry on NAMIS? Uh, we have tried uh, to gather a 10 year rainfall data from all the districts, um, the 28 districts. So we wanted to start uh, importing uh, rainfall data. Uh, we have been working uh, with um, uh, Dr. Tuonge Manda and his team from the University of Malawi. They're the ones who developed uh, the NAMES system on the DHIS2. So we want to have a partnership with the University of Malawi in capacity building and uh, development of instruments uh, for additional weather parameters. Uh, collaboration with the University of Oslo for climate change. Uh, here, we also want to have in partnership, uh, a collaborating with the uh, University of Oslo, so whereby we can have uh, more research on how we can uh, use uh, the dish high tool uh, system in the agriculture sector to do with climate change, to do with uh, agriculture extension, and the other modules uh, that we have developed uh, under uh, the NAMI system. Collaboration with the Department of uh, Meteorological Services in our ministry, uh, in our sorry, in our country, in the dissemination of uh, climate products. So we want uh, that we need to link with this uh, the system that they are using and our system on the best approach on how we can uh, be disseminating these uh, climate products uh, to the farmers uh, and to the public in general and also farmer advisory services. We want our system not to be a system where we just collect information, but also should be able to benefit uh, the farmers themselves. How can they utilize the system? How can the NAMI system be able uh, to benefit them? So we want it at the end of the day, uh, this system should be able to provide advisory services uh, to the farmers that we work with. And, uh, Another one that we want uh, to do is integration of remote sensing and GIS in yield estimation. So as a ministry, we are mandated to collect uh, agricultural production estimates. Also that guides us in terms of uh, the food uh, security of our country. And currently we are using traditional methods uh, or methodology in our collection of uh, uh, production figures, but our aim is that we want uh, to use the remote testing and the GIS in yield estimation. So we want to use uh, how we can use uh, the DHS2 platform in estimation of uh, this uh, production estimation. So lastly, I would like to acknowledge uh, the assistance uh, that have been provided by the Matidona Trust Fund. Uh, it's a group of uh, donors uh, that uh, they pull their resources into one basket and uh, finance uh, different projects. And they, they had to finance uh, the ASWAP SP2, which has uh, hugely uh, supported uh, the NAMIS system. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Jenner. That, that was, um, it's really impressive how many different types of users and different types of data have been brought into, into DHIS2 and how that data looking backwards actually helps uh, to plan forwards. So our last presentation, uh, we have um, Ophelia Maimele the, uh, from the Ministry of Health Mozambique, HMIS unit, uh, to be delivered with Zephyrino Salgeni of uh, Sound Digitus. Refresh. <laughs> My name is Ophelia. I'm working in Minister of Health. 
Mozambique in information system and managing. So we are here, we share, we share our experience in integrating climate diets in DHS2. But now my colleague will continue our presentation. Okay. Thank you. Uh, I'm Zephyr Saujan. So um, I'm working with the Ophelia or supporting the Minister of Health in the uh, process of integrating climate data in the DHIS2. Now it's okay. My head is not. Okay. Okay. Uh, <laughs> Okay, so um, I, I hope that now it's okay. So um, yes, um, as I was saying, that we are we are we are going to share the experience on uh, sharing or integrating uh, climate data uh, in the uh, with the DHIS two, uh, and then this is work from Mozambique. Uh, as a contextualization, with the outbreaks have been overwhelming in Mozambique. I think you had even the Malawi experience as well. So this is a situation that we are we are facing in most of our countries. So, so in 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 order to to deal with that, we need um, data on time, and there is not only health data, but we need also data coming from other sources like climb uh, and uh, other 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 type of data. So, Minister of Health um, is committed uh, in the development of um, a platform. I think in the morning we, we shared in the, in the plenary the, 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 the effort that the Minister of Health has been uh, uh, doing in the last couple of years in the, de in the development of this integrated uh, disease surveillance module with the aim to uh, be used to, for several areas in managing special the, the disease surveillance data uh, to empower the air forecast with the real-time data, and um, also be used uh, or allow uh, the, the different stakeholders to have a platform where they can um, use self data for uh, resp uh, to, to as a support to response to respond for the different crises. So this is an example of a, 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 a screenshot with the different modules that have been developed as part of the disease surveillance. And also, this is uh, the 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 aim is also take other data, not only the one that is here, but it, 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 uh, we also shared the, the Ministry of Health and several other modules. So the the uh, this, this surveillance or surveillance data that uh, uh, is produced through those systems will be somehow shared to this to the to into this this surveillance module so that it can be used for 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 uh, um, uh, to, to respond to the different emergencies. So um, on the other way, um, there, there, there is also another effort on having uh, an integrated uh, earlier warning system um, that uh, can aggregate uh, data coming from different uh, different sources. Uh, this process um, it comes from a couple of years back where, where we had uh, projects um, uh, in some provinces uh, to, for example, to alert uh, the, the, the farmers with a notification when, for example, there is um, certain emergencies. So we start uh, building this uh, repository where, with uh, some information. And then this repository is based on DHIS2. Uh, it's the same that we are going to extend or uh, to, to uh, link that with the um, HMIS uh, in order for to, 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 to empower uh, Minister of Health with the uh, a platform that will be used to manage prevention or uh, mitigate some of the, um, the, uh, the problems that we, we always uh, are face when, whenever there are uh, um, issues like uh, the cyclone and also other recent threats that uh, affect the, the, the country. So um, this, uh, as part of that, that, that process, we, we started um, um, there was a, a, a project also that uh, we started using climate data uh, in, for, for health. Uh, that project, for, that, for, the, for the implementation of that project, we, we were using uh, global data, climate data. Uh, but uh, when we started doing some um, analysis of the data, 
and um, discussion on those data, there was advised that it will be good to have local produced data. So the, in that, in order to 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 deal with that, uh, we, we we approach the national the meteorological institute in order to understand how are they collecting the data and um, be able to generate or collect or collect all the uh, local data. And then we start visiting these weather stations. Uh, there are some pictures here from that are, we are taken. With the, some of these are manual weather stations, the other the automatic weather stations. They generate data um, frequently, routinely, the manual, they, 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 they do it every hour, but they, they automatically generate frequently. So the idea is to get this data into a platform and then make sure this this this, info, this data can be shared uh, or, or, or used to um, with other models and then to in, in link it with DHIS2 so that um, um, uh, information could, can be used to uh, predict some specific um, uh, um, uh, uh, um, outbreaks or like, for example, the, the, what, what we have, we, we did do the, 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 the first exercise in adopting the, 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 the climate data in DHS2 we did with malaria program, where it's possible to have some uh, uh, prediction on the uh, possible occurrences of uh, malaria uh, outbreak, which we are sharing. This is an example where we are taking climate data and then using some statistical model to predict the probability of having any incident or other aspects. And then this is where we are generating it on a weekly basis. And then this information, as I mentioned, it, is, it was taken from global uh, weather uh, um, uh, sources. And the idea is to get this data being uh, collected from our um, uh, weather stations. And then here there are other examples of dashboard that were produced and then where we have weekly uh, data, and then there are also prediction or possibilities uh, of uh, getting data. For example, if there is an outbreak, you will see in the map there, more dark uh, the colors there showing that there is a possibility of having outbreak in so those, those specific districts, get, uh, using the specific data from uh, previous previous weeks. Um, yeah, so this is where we end our presentation. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ophelia, and uh, to Zeferino. And I particularly like that uh, you really showed us the way to early warning, which is not just waiting until you have enough data to see what happened before, but actually using and bringing those predictive capabilities based on the weather data into your system. So I believe we might have time for one or two questions before the transition. So are there any burning questions? from our audience. And examples for, uh, I think it's a new buzzword, One Health Intelligence, but some, some tangible things behind it. Um, and um, I think what we also have seen that um, I, I, I was thinking a bit about the use cases in the second presentation from Malawi, and we have seen a perfect example in the latest presentation um, in Mozambique that is pretty much in the area of um, modeling and a little bit in the area of forecasting and now casting. So these aspects of early warning. And I, I'm wondering, it, it, it's very interesting to see after some time and evaluation of this, how, how much this really uh, is feasible for early warning aspects, because uh, it's pretty much, it's it's very new that we, we pull in this climate data for um, forecasting public health events, uh, vector uh, impact and so on. And I think 
uh, especially in over the next couple of years, the results will be really, really important uh, to draw the lessons learned from this. Thank you. Where are we on the time? Four minutes. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Um, Doreen Ali, I'm from Malawi, but I'm in the health sector. I know that NAMISI is equal to, I think, HMIs, but I think we are going to the community level. How is your work uh, going to be aligned uh, to the integrated community health information system? Because we are using the same community. We are using the same people uh, at the community level. How do you see these two aligning? Because uh, are we already there? My department is already in the community. Your department is in the community. How do we align these two uh, systems to talk to each other? Secondly, um, on the issues uh, of them to collaborate, I was thinking, are you collaborating with the agriculture uh, natural resources from also the University of Luana. Are uh, you also tapping some of the information from there uh, while you are doing your work? Thank you. Get one last one. Was it you? Did you have a question comment? No, no, no. Or you were just nodding me? Okay. Then I think, uh, unless Jennifer wants to take a moment to respond or just consider this a comment, I'll let you respond, Jennifer, and then we can uh, close the session. Okay. Uh, thank you very much, Madam Ali, uh, for the uh, two questions uh, that you have uh, raised uh, with, with my colleague. So maybe they're going to just, uh, just add up some key points on that one. Yeah, so on um, the alignment of the two systems, uh, I think, um, we have to do an assessment uh, when we go to the when we go back to the country and discuss on the best approach on how we are going to align the two systems. Uh, looking that uh, the ministry has already has its own administrative structure, and also the Ministry of Agriculture has also its own or own administrative structure where we we collect our data and. Um, the ones that are collecting information uh, in the healthy and the agriculture sector, there are two uh, different uh, staff. So I think that's an area whereby the Ministry of Health and the Ministry of Agriculture have to sit down and look at the best approach to align these two systems. On yeah, on the yeah, on the collaborations, yeah, we work with the natural resources, the Ministry of Natural Resources through the Department of Metrological Services, and also we work with uh, Rwanda when we are doing our research and also when we are uh, coming up with uh, different reports uh, within the ministry. Thank you. Thank you so much to our presenters. And uh, you have our platform product manager, uh, David, just behind you, and you can talk to him about aligning org units. So uh, ready to move on to the next session. Thank you, everyone.